LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com My life fades, the vision dims, all that remains are memories. I remember a time of chaos, ruined dreams, this wasted land. But most of all, I remember the road warrior, the man we call Max. To understand who he was, you have to go back to another time when the world was powered by the black fuel and the desert sprouted great cities of pipe and steel. Gone now, swept away. For reasons long forgotten, two mighty warrior tribes went to war and touched off a blaze which engulfed them all. Without fuel, they were nothing. They'd built a house of straw. The thundering machine sputtered and stopped. Their leaders talked, and talked, and talked. But nothing could stem the avalanche. Their world crumbled. The cities exploded. A whirlwind of looting. A firestorm of fear. Men began to feed on men. On the roads, it was a white line nightmare. Only those mobile enough to scavenge, brutal enough to pillage, would survive. The gangs took over the highways, ready to wage war for a tank of juice. And in this maelstrom of decay, ordinary men were battered and smashed. Men like Max, the warrior Max. In the roar of an engine, he lost everything. became a shell of a man, a burnt out, desolate man, a man haunted by the demons of his past, a man who wandered out into the wasteland, and it was here, in this blighted place, that he learned to live again. Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Lewis Dartnell who joins us to discuss his book, The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World from Scratch. Maybe it was a viral pandemic or an asteroid strike or perhaps nuclear war. Whatever the cause, the world as we know it has ended and you and the other survivors must start again. What key knowledge would you need to start rebuilding civilization from scratch? Once you've scavenged what you can, how do you begin producing the essentials? How do you grow food, generate power, prepare medicines, or get metal out of rocks? Could you avert another dark age, or take shortcuts to accelerate redevelopment? Living in the modern world, we have become disconnected from the basic processes that support our lives as well as the fundamentals of science that enable us to relearn things for ourselves. The Knowledge is a Journey of Discovery, a book which explains everything you need to know about everything. It's a quick start guide for rebooting civilization which will transform your understanding of the world and help you prepare for when it's no longer here.
Hello and welcome, Lewis, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Hi there, Greg. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. Uh, today, we're going to talk, Lewis, about your uh, recent book, uh, The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World from Scratch. Before we get into that, just tell listeners a little bit about your background and how you came to write the book in the first place. Oh, so I'm a, I'm a research scientist. Um, I have a position up at University of Leicester, and the field of science I work in is called astrobiology. It's all about looking into the possibility of life beyond Earth. Uh, so I've come from a, a biology background, and a lot of the work I do is thinking about the survival limits of, of life, what kind of conditions it can tolerate, and, and where on Mars uh, and other planets in the solar system you might expect to find uh, alien life, extraterrestrial life. And importantly, what kind of evidence of that life we'd want to build, you know, equipment and instruments trying to detect what are the, the so-called biosignatures that we can detect and how, how well would they persist. So it's all these different areas. It's a very what's known as interdisciplinary research areas. There's a lot of biology and chemistry and physics and planetary science all kind of wrapped together. And uh, my first book, actually, Life in the Universe, A Beginner's Guide, it was basically a popular science book kind of introducing all of this stuff, astrobiology and, and the, the cutting edge in our, in our search for life beyond the Earth. And the new book, uh, The Knowledge, is, is on something completely different. And this is purely curiosity-driven. This is just a, a thought experiment from beginning to end, something that I've been mulling over in, in the back of my mind for a few years now. And then the kind of premise for this thought experiment is, um, imagine there's, there's been some kind of apocalypse, some kind of doomsday event, and 99.99% of, of humanity has disappeared, has been wiped out, and you've survived, and you've kind of fallen in with a, a community of, of other survivors. What do you do now? How, how can you start um, how can you ensure that you can thrive in, in the short term? What do you need to know in order to survive and be able to you know, provide enough food and drinking water and the kind of essentials for yourself? But I think much more interestingly than that, to kind of move beyond like a survival manual, how could you actually start rebuilding a civilization from scratch? How could you reboot a civilization all over again and try to kind of accelerate its progress as, as much as possible? Now, I recently treated myself to a DVD box set of an old TV show that was a very big part of my life growing up. Um, it was something that was very influential on me, and it was called Out of Town with Jack Hargreaves. I don't know if you remember that. I've not come across that, no. Well, it was basically this old guy who uh, was born in between the wars, I reckon, and it was made in the 70s and early 80s, and it was all about, uh, it was called Subtitled A Country Diary. And yeah. it was all about dyeing crafts and, and heritage skills. And in the 70s and early 80s, he was bemoaning how these were dying out. People's in unfamiliarity with all these old tools and skills yeah. and, and modern, as he said then, modern uh, society's inability to do basic things, you know, like make a pair of boots or gut a fish and just all sorts of things that people had done for thousands of years. And anyway, watching these recently and also reading your book, it reminded me how most people have few, if any, practical skills when it comes to the sort of areas that you were talking about you know how to survive and since jack hargreaves day of course there's been a great explosion of technology and that's all yeah. wonderful but that wouldn't be any good to us an iphone won't help us if we're faced with the sort of situation that you're you know imagining that's it. i think you're absolutely right that the the way i describe it is that our kind of survival skills have, have atrophied um, over the years and as you're saying just a generation or two ago in, in the past people would be growing a lot of their own food they'd be you know even during the second world war people growing victory gardens and, and they knew how to cultivate and grow food and people would kind of uh, spin their own their own yarn and kind of weave it into into clothes and things and none of us in the developed world do that anymore we, we've kind of lost all these these crucial skills and, and of course there's no reason that that's necessarily a problem and the the population in a society, you know, kind of grows with the development of, of the society as a whole. So people are much more numerate nowadays and they're much more uh, skillful and experienced when it comes to using you know, information technology and computers. And, and that's fine because that's the world we live in. But as I was saying, it was a thought experiment. I was really curious to kind of wind back the hands of time and kind of dig down into what would be the skills and, and experiences and the knowledge you would need if you had to start from scratch. And I, I, I mean, I really hope we don't. I, I'm not some kind of doomsayer where the, the end of the world is nigh, placard around my neck. I don't think the world is about to end. And I'm, if anything, using that kind of apocalyptic scenario 
as just a, you know a narrative conceit, as just a, a way of holding up a mirror to our society, so we can ask these these deep questions about what are the you know the fundamental behind the scenes stuff that we take for granted and don't really even you know, realize um, on a day to day basis anymore. No, and it was interesting to read your book, which is a little bit different from some other similar ones I'd read because of the perspective that you're bringing to it. Some of the other books I'd read and DVDs I'd watched, and indeed people I've interviewed here, they are stockpiling cans of beans and ammo, if you see what yeah. I mean. So that's their the angle they're coming from. There's a very large prepper community as well. I mean, this isn't some kind of fringe thing. In, in America, there's estimated to be up to a million preppers. So there's a lot of people that take this uh, this idea, this notion very seriously. And if you're living in somewhere like, you know, L.A., where there is a, a big risk of, of, of earthquakes, you are in a geophysically unstable area. It makes absolute perfect sense to keep a stockpile of some fresh water and, and some canned food and things. But it's very interesting when people go beyond that and will completely change their lifestyle and move out of cities preemptively and, you know, kind of blockade themselves into these fortified compounds and stockpile a lot of you know, kind of food and, and, and weaponry and ammunition things. Um, because from my own point of view, I don't think that's in response to a genuine threat. Actually, I don't see any particular reason to believe that the world is about to end or there's about to be some kind of catastrophic collapse of, of civilization. Um, but there's this whole spectrum in, in the prepper community. Well, do you know what? Maybe I've just been hanging around with too many of these people, but <laughs> living in the UK here, after the initial avian flu scare, which was, what was that, like 2006 or something like that, 2007, can't quite remember that, it came to nothing. And in the light of the recent Ebola thing, I was quite glad I'd kind of kept it. But I've got an excess of cupboard space in the kitchen, and I do have in the far corner behind the bin what I call the apocalypse cupboard. <laughs> and it's uh, full of uh, probably quite bad food like macaroni cheese and stag chili. But I've, I've got it full, and there's enough there for two months. Yeah. And uh, I just leave it there. And it's, you know, people have, have said, Are you serious? You've done that. And I said, Well, do you know what? There might arise a situation where even in this country that I might say, do you know what, I, I don't want to go out this week. I think I'll just stay in to see what happens. You know? I, I said, I think that's imminently sensible. And I draw a, stink, a distinction between making very reasonable, um, you know, reserves of, of food and, and like I say, kind of purified water for a couple of days to a couple of weeks in case there's some kind of disruption to services. And, you know, even I say, even in the UK where we're in a wonderfully, uh, geologically stable area. We don't really get natural disasters in the UK, but we still do have kind of hiccups. And um, there was the fuel shortage, the petrol shortages a couple of years ago, and people were queuing for hours and hours and hours, panic buying fuel. So it would have been very sensible if you'd kept just a couple of jerry cans of, of petrol in your garage, just to kind of, you know, remove yourself from that kind of hassle. And again, it doesn't take much to disrupt the, the few, food distribution and, and things might start getting a bit chaotic in supermarkets. So it makes absolute sense to keep a, a small stockpile in, like I say, in your, in your kind of cupboard. But I would draw a line between that and those kind of sensible precautions. So as I say, people that um, are kind of stockpiling weapons and, and genuinely believe there's gonna be a complete and catastrophic disintegration of, of society as a whole, and you know, death of, of millions of people. I, I think that, I say, in my personal view, is, is pushing a, a, a bit too far. Now, in the immediate aftermath, you know, of, of some sort of cataclysm, um, there would be a question of the length of transition that there would be um, for people to begin to get back on their feet again. Whether that's just you know, in the immediate sort of basic stability, or whether it's actually start thinking about de development again. And of course, that situation is very much affected by the nature of any disaster. Yeah. Um, you know, if it was a solar outburst, for example, which took out all the electrics, if a comet hit the planet, I mean, that would be a much bigger scale. A pandemic, uh, nuclear war is probably the um, the worst case scenario. In fact, I think you say that in terms of our prospects, that a pandemic would probably be offered the best prospects for getting back on our feet and something like a global nuclear war would be the worst case scenario. Yes, exactly. If you, if you got to choose which apocalyptic scenario you were to survive and then had to start from scratch from that point, you would definitely not tick the box for nuclear holocaust um, because it would be a very bleak and desolate landscape that you would kind of find yourself in. And, and trying to restart agriculture during a kind of nuclear winter would, would be exceedingly challenging. And so, as I say, just, just the, the starting point of this thought experiment, and I'm slightly tongue in cheek in the book, uh, I explain that the best way for the world to end, as it were, would be some kind of pandemic flu where you, you kill all the people, but the stuff 
and the infrastructure and the kind of raw materials are left behind that will greatly help you and aid you uh, as you kind of reboot from scratch again. Um, and so at the end of the day, the, the, the knowledge, the book is a popular science book about how our civilization works on a fundamental level and how it kind of progressed through the through the centuries and through the millennia. Um, so I tried to pick try to pick a, the kind of cleanest starting point that I could in order to get down into and to explain the nitty gritty of the science. Have you seen the movie out of New Zealand uh, from the early 80s called Quiet Earth? Yes, I, I watched that during during research uh, for the book, actually. It's, it's, it's very distinctively a 1980s film, isn't it? But it's, yeah, very much. It's a lot of fun in its own right. Yeah, well, that uh, I, that was reminded of that when you were talking about uh, what you call a grace period. And if we do take the scenario where there hasn't been a nuclear war, you know, there hasn't been a lot of devastation, that there's just been a lot of atrophy of the human population, that food and fuel and lots of other supplies, medicines and stuff, would initially be extremely plentiful. And you had a really interesting little st- statistic in there that one, you know, sizable su- supermarket could theoretically keep one person alive for a lifetime, assuming that they weren't aged one when they started. And I, I, I was thinking, well, yeah, actually, you know, if you're eating, you, you might suffer some dietary problems, but if you're eating a couple of cans of food a day, and as you say, starting with all the fresh stuff, um, you could go for a very long time. Yeah, that's it. So, so I calculated that... Uh... If, if you were to lock someone in a supermarket and then see how long they could survive before they starved up or the food ran out or went off, uh, you could survive about 55 years, I calculated, uh, in an average supermarket. And that was just to, to again, I mean, the numbers will vary depending on how big the supermarket is, of course, but that was just to get across the idea that there was an enormous reserve of food on the shelves that would remain preserved for a long period of time and would offer this grace period, offer this kind of buffer zone where you wouldn't have to you know, the, the very first morning when you kind of wake up with a hangover from the morning after the night before when the world, as we know, has ended, you wouldn't have to literally that very first day start working out how agriculture works to kind of food to provide food for yourself or, you know, refining your own fuels and, and, and things like that, because there'd be enough lying around that you could scavenge for and, and forage and, and repurpose. But again, I mean, there's an immediate caveat to that statement that it depends enormously on how many other people have survived. And in many ways, for the prospects of rebuilding cleanly afterwards, the worst case scenario would be something like a coronal mass ejection, a kind of solar event that knocks out the le- locks out with electronics or the electrics and would and could possibly lead to a collapse of society and civilization after that. But you still have everyone walking around and healthy and therefore competing uh, for all of these leftover resources. And then you would have a kind of a secondary mass die off. It'd be a very unpleasant you know, kind of dog eat dog world, which which again feeds immediately into all these tropes from sci-fi cinema we're familiar with and kind of Mad Max and then things like that. Um, but provided there's a small enough surviving community, um, which isn't unrealistic for certain scenarios, uh, then you would find a large reserve of stuff around to provide this grace period as you start learning stuff for yourself and, and you know, kind of learning by trial and error how to do things for yourself again and including things like agriculture and making sure you can grow your own food but before it becomes a matter of life and death well thinking again about the quiet earth and talking about re-establishing a community you ponder at what point if there was an extreme die-off and there were hardly any people on the planet whatsoever particularly if they weren't in touch with each other to what extent people would give up what what is the fundamental impulse for the human race to survive because in the quiet earth the protagonist initially thinks he's alone and then yeah. he finds two other people, a man and a woman. And it's a very uncomfortable dynamic, you know, threes a crowd. It's a bit of a threesome, yeah. But you can immediately see that, that the men are thinking breeding, you know, they're thinking sex. And that's natural. It's an impulse. Yeah. And you, in your book, you also talk about the practicalities of actually repopulating the earth. Because if you just had a man and a woman, for example, and they managed to conceive children, well, you're looking at a dangerously inbred situation that that's not that's not going to work. That, that's not genetically viable, yeah. So again, the, the kind of Adam and Eve trope is very, very common in a lot of post-apocalyptic uh, literature and, and, and films. Um, but of course, it would be impossible in terms of the, the genetic diversity and the long-term viability of a population founded from just two people. And you can, you can look at similar scenarios where there's been founding populations which have then expanded and grown over the centuries and if you look at um, the indigenous Maori in New Zealand or the indigenous North Americans, uh, genetic evidence suggests that these were 
uh, founded by uh, by single events, by single group of people arriving on that island or in the North America, um, and then you know, having lots of babies and kind of the population growing over time. And that initial founding population seems to have consisted of between about 70 and 100 breeding females. So perhaps 200, 300 people in total would include the kind of men and children that would have gone with them. So it seems that if you if you did genuinely need to repopulate the world, and in terms of genetic diversity, you'd probably be safe with just a, a few hundred people to kind of start from, from as your kind of your genetic basis, your genetic stock. And similar numbers have come up with studies that people have been looking into try to work out how humanity might start colonizing other star systems, other planets, and, and how many people you'd have to send in some kind of arc ship or colony ship to make sure you've got enough genetic diversity in your, in your initial population. And again, numbers of, of a few hundred come up from that. So it seems quite reasonable to expect that if you have even a, a very, very extraordinarily extreme uh, extinction, near extinction event, with just a few hundred people left behind, you'd probably be okay. Humanity could probably pull itself back up from the brink, from, from even that even that position. Now you mentioned Mad Max, and of course, most people will be familiar with that post-apocalyptic trilogy. And it, in many ways, shows in, in its, within its own scenario what happens, you know, it's the end of the oil age and the breakdown of society. And that's, so, you know, the, as you mentioned earlier, the numbers of the people remain the same initially, but society starts to break down. In many ways, it shows a typical arc of recovery. You know, in the first film, you have the breakdown of um, yeah. society and things start to get nasty. In the second film, you have, you know, roving gangs. But you also have the beginning of uh, communities that are, want to be peaceful and they're starting to try and defend themselves. Yeah. And then in the third film, you have um, the establishment of uh, more generally more peaceful. It's still a lot of violence, but it's like regulated violence. It's sort of policed. Yeah. And you have towns and things are starting, you have fuel sources and it's starting to get back to, I mean, it's still extremely primitive, but it's almost like, you know, humans just have that urge to develop up to a certain level that, you know, our current stage of development, we're not going to be content with going back to being hunter gatherers as long as there's a memory of something big that we did. But this is it exactly. I think humanity is inherently a, a social uh, cooperative and, and community-minded species. We, we've achieved great things through history because we are good at banding together and living peacefully, largely living together peacefully, and working together on kind of big projects and kind of cooperating on things. And so I, I would, of course, be exceedingly naive to try to pretend that if society were to disintegrate and law and order were to evaporate and there'd be no more you know, kind of police force or army or repercussions if you misbehave and kind of treat each other badly. Of course, if society collapses, there will be violence. There will be people that take advantage of each other and exert their, uh, assert, assert their will on, each, on, the, on the kind of weaker or more vulnerable people. That will, will certainly happen. But but I don't think that's that's the be on the end. I think there will be a period of turmoil and chaos and things will start settling down again. And even if it's just the extent that you get a local warlord who achieves, you know, domination over over other people and over a particular region you'll get relative stability in that sense in that case and then the question becomes a very important one what now how do you start recovering and pulling yourself back up by your bootstraps and start going through you know kind of revolutions of a social nature as well going from this kind of perhaps warlord or kind of feudal system back up through more egalitarian societies as um, you get more complex societies over time as we saw through history well, I think most people's experience of life um, in most parts of the world anyway, certainly for quite a long time, as several lifetimes, has been that most people don't want violent anarchy. They want, you know, some form of order and control and they don't want to harm other people. They want to be left in peace with their friends and family. And yes. that works for the most part. It's just a question of, you know, does the state have the monopoly on violence, which it quite often does in the West, for example, um, or is it in the hands of less discriminating people. I mean, even in Mad Max, we see as a counter to the um, the roving brigands who are just rape and pillage, you know, for themselves. Yeah. They, they don't see any future. They're just nihilistically living their lives like animals. You see someone like Max himself, who is not a bad man. He knows fighting, he knows weapons, and he's able to be talked into helping to defend the weaker community. And in that, you have the beginning of what he was in the first place, which is a police force, I suppose. Yeah. I think... I think to a certain extent, people's impression of what might happen after an apocalypse and in a kind of post-collapse world, 
are largely coloured or, or tainted by these films and what they've kind of experienced from watching these films. And of course, for kind of dramatic tension, for the kind of sake of the narrative, you've got to have evil characters. You've got a lot of a, have a lot of baddies. The goodies then have to kind of fight against and kind of ultimately succeed. And I don't think it's the case you'll get in a, in a post-apocalyptic world where you'll get people being evil or nasty for the sake of it. You won't get people running around killing just for the joy of killing. Um, at the end of the day, people want to be safe. And as I said, that there will be a period of violence when you might have to take what you need. Um, but, but I think things will settle down and there will always be outlaws. But I'm not sure they'll, they'll be kind of the dominant factor once things start settling down. People will, will band together for, for safety numbers and kind of mutual protection. And I think quite readily in a post-apocalyptic world, as you were saying, you'll get to this kind of, you know, um, town state. We have kind of communities kind of dot around the, the, the countryside and maybe beyond their sphere of influence, there'd be kind of, you know, outlaws and, and um, robbers on the roads or something. But, but I think things would settle down pretty, pretty quickly. Well, I read once, you know, or more than once, actually, uh, people speculating, oh, yes, but in that sort of breakdown in all the prisons, the doors were flung wide open and there's all those psychos in there. But they're in there. They're, they were part of society anyway. They did what they did in a non-apocalyptic situation and they got put in prison for it. And it's not the majority of the population. And, and sadly, there are still murderers and rapists running around out there now outside of the prisons. And unfortunately, it has been that way for the, possibly forever in human history, though we did see in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, that was quite instructive in some ways, particularly for disaster planners and other concerned people as to, you know, there was some behaviour there that was perhaps unexpected. Maybe some of it was expected, but certainly some of these things that happened were, were quite shocking. But as you would perhaps be quick to point out, there was a lot of pulling together and cooperation as well. Yeah, I, I, and, and again, I'm not trying to pretend that everything was rosy after Hurricane Katrina, but the stories that get reported, the stories that people remember, are the most extreme stories of of the violence, the mugging, and and, and rapes that m- might have happened. Not the ninety nine percent nine percent of of the behaviour, which was which was community minded and kind of peaceful, and people helping together and you know looking after their neighbours. So, you, like I say, like in Hurricane Katrina, when you have a, a regional or a local um, snapping of this of this social contract contract when i say that the police force disappears for time being you are going to get misbehavior but um i don't think that's going to come to dominate there was a fascinating thing that you relate in the book another chap with an interest in this area who thinking ahead uh, trying to answer some of these questions uh, constructed a toaster from scratch and i really do mean from scratch and that Mm. was so interesting to you know to, to what it actually took for something that's so mundane and we even you take a toaster apart it's relatively simple but you try doing it literally from scratch, then it, it really opens our eyes up to like how advanced a world we do live in. Yeah, this this was a great example. This is Thomas Thwaites' uh, The Toaster Project. Um, and he, as you're saying, he wanted to work out that this the, the simplest appliance that we're likely to use on a day-to-day basis. This isn't high-tech like an iPhone or a laptop. This is something that has just like an outer casing and some heating elements that run by electricity and a very simple kind of lever mechanism on the inside to, to move the, the toast in and out or the bread in and out as it's toasted. And even something like that turned out to be incredibly difficult to, to build from scratch using your own hands. And I interviewed Thomas um, when I was researching for the knowledge and I had a fascinating chat with him. And he went to such extents of getting himself down uh, to an iron mine and picking up the bits of, of hematite of the iron ore and then trying to smelt that rock himself with a kind of back backyard back garden um, furnace that you try to construct um, with you know, kind of barbecue charcoals and a leaf blower for, for, for bellows and trying to extract the iron the metal out of that rock um, and he tried to create a kind of um, primitive plastic to use the outer casing and he went to a mica quarry to try to get something that's electrically insulating the mica sheets that he could kind of wrap his his iron wires around um, for, the, for the heating elements and I think the way I described it in the knowledge that um, he, he made something that looked a bit like a toaster it never worked it never toasted any bread because it almost self-destructed instantly when he tried to turn it on but the, the phrase I described it with is that it is kind of grotesquely beautiful in its own right and if you, and if you go to the toaster project website or, or follow the link through the, the knowledge's website which is the hyphen knowledge.org um, you can have a look at a, a photograph 
um, of this toaster and you'll see exactly what I mean that it, it, it kind of looks a bit like a toaster but you can really see the kind of rawness and the kind of primitiveness of, of what he was able to achieve um, and I think it's, it's a great example as you're saying of, of this widening chasm between what people today are actually knowledgeable or ex have the expertise to, to be able to achieve themselves and all the stuff we take for granted that kind of civilization as a whole now performs for us and you know, I say no one makes their own clothes anymore you just go to a shop on the high street where things magically appear on the uh, on the hangers. Now, in terms of our industrial civilization's reliance on oil, um, another big question is, and as a background to this, we'll use the scenario you're talking about, which is you know depopulation. So we have hardly any people, but we still have the stuff. Yeah. Then we start looking at transport, and all the vehicles are still there. Trains, planes, automobiles, as they say. Do, do, well, you, do you still have people who can fly the planes, operate the trains? That's another question. Would yeah. you need to if you had hardly any people? We'd have a lot of stocks of fuel, but then you start to get into issues of how long that would last. And going forward, maybe a generation, you know, did we start bringing horses back into the equation? Can somebody devise some way of making, refining some new fuel? Then there's a question of maintaining the cars. And um, I had a friend who went for his honeymoon to Cuba many years ago, and he told me a fascinating story about the taxi driver who drove them around for the weekend yeah. and uh, how they keep their cars going for decades and decades by sort of fabricating these parts that are no longer made anywhere else. Yeah, they, they kind of cannibalize the, the spare parts components off, uh, off, off, of, of cars as they kind of fall out of service. They, uh, they call them yank tanks because they're all kind of dating back to 1950s uh, American designs. But that's another good contemporary example of people dealing with some of the issues that you're talking about and that, you know it just shines a little light on what might be possible yeah so throughout the knowledge throughout the book I tried to be really careful to make sure that it wasn't just you know kind of being wildly speculative and just trying to make up what might be possible and I was always trying to root root it all back in stuff that is a solid example from our own history that demonstrates you know, the kind of ingenuity and the resourcefulness of, of humanity and, and how people have been able to pull off astounding feats of survival or, or capability from, 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 simple, uh, from a simple basis. And things like the, the, the kind of car mechanics in Cuba are a very good example of that. Um, another example I talked about in the context of electricity and being able to kind of hack together or jury rig uh, generators for yourself once the grid goes down because electricity is, is obviously one of those things you can't stockpile once the grid goes down electricity just disappears and you can't keep a cupboard full of, of cans um, in the same way and there's a really good example from the uh, Bosnian war where a city called uh, Grazda was surrounded by the Serbian Bosnian army uh, and was cut off from the rest of the world was cut off from the, from the electricity grid and although they received uh, airlifts, drops from the UN for food and, and medication, they didn't get electricity coming in. And what the inhabitants of the city did, what they were able to achieve for themselves, is scavenge and forage and repurpose different bits of junk they found lying around. And they created these paddle wheels, these kind of water mills, which they um, floated in the river and kind of tethered to the bridges. So the water would flow underneath um, these water mills and turn the paddles. And they scavenged the alternators out of cars, which work really well as a kind of uh, plug and play electricity generator for yourself. And they, they generated that power and then sent it down to the bank um, on wires they have kind of threaded down the, down the bridges. So it's a really great example let's say, of the kind of resourcefulness of, of humanity when you're not back to, to your basics. Um, and there's, there's a whole range of examples I, I, I try to, to use and highlight throughout the book of, of, of things like this. Now, you spoke earlier about the importance of agriculture. Obviously, food production is central um, to any civilization, however small. That currently depends on mechanization, scale, chemical inputs and what have you. Um, but of course, we're thinking of our modern industrial agriculture, and it's not like all agriculture across the entire planet is conducted in that way. In many parts of the world, Africa and parts of Asia, it's still very labor intensive and when eventually, even before the canned food ran out, um, some surviving society may actually decide they want a better diet and they would start growing food for themselves again. Yeah. And um, I spent some time on an organic farm, which was very low on mechanization. So I got a bit of insight into what it takes. And yes, it requires some backbreaking work. But if you go back to the sort of agricultural models that we, we had for the most part, for most of human history, but more sustainable, it's very, very doable 
if you can get some basic, your book's about some basic knowledge <laughs> about, you know, seasons and how to, what plants to grow with other plants and how to create biodiversity that's sustainable. Yeah, this is it. So the the, the modern uh, industrialized agriculture we, we use in the developed world um, is is hugely reliant on pesticides um, and insecticides. And, and these things, these organic compounds would be exceedingly difficult for you to try and create from yourself. They rely on some pretty sophisticated organic chemistry to synthesize these, these artificial compounds. So you basically get denied that after the apocalypse. Um, and you can use whatever stocks you can find in farms or you know, kind of agricultural distribution warehouses. But once that stuff is gone or deteriorated and degraded, it's going to be very hard for you to, to make it for yourself. And same with the artificial fertilizers we use. So there's stuff like uh, potash, which if you're lucky, you might be able to, to, to mine, to, to throw on your fields for, for nitrate. Um, sorry, for potassium. And you also need kind of nitrate uh, from elsewhere. But you'll find it very hard to, to create these artificial fertilizers yourselves. And the nitrates we use today are created by the harbour process, which is some very high technology, uh, industrial chemistry that you'll find exceedingly difficult to keep going yourself. So as you're saying, you'll be knocked back to a more primitive, a more simpler, slightly less productive or effective system. And again, if we look back in history to see how it has been done in the past, the hope would be that you could drop back down to that slightly simpler system to catch your society from aggressing too far. And then you can start building back up from there. And things like um, crop rotation and, and the, the Norfolk four course rotation, which was used very effectively uh, in Britain from the kind of agricultural revolution of the Middle Ages, from the medieval period. These are the kind of techniques you want to go back to. And in particular, the, the kind of knowledge that as to why land starts getting tired and crops start failing or being less productive is to do with the amount of, of nitrate, this kind of plant nutrients in the soil. And one very good natural way of returning nitrate to the soil, if you don't have artificial fertilizers, is to grow legumes, which grow things like um, peas or alfalfa or soy, which are a whole category of plants that have bacteria growing in their roots that release nitrate back into the soil. So if you have some kind of crop rotation, if you alternate back and forth between things like cereal crops, like wheat or barley or oats and legumes, you can try and maintain the, the, the fertility of that land so it doesn't kind of slowly degrade over time as medieval farmers were, were finding as, as their agriculture kind of ground on and on. And so it's, it's, so it's kind of tips like this that, that I try to present um, through the knowledge. But again, as you're saying, that there's many different agricultural systems that are used throughout the world. And what works well in Europe might not work so well in Africa or Asia. But at, but at some point, you've got to you know, kind of focus on one, one particular problem and, and try to explain that within the context of a book. You can't survey everything that happens all the way around the world. So I, I try to be as kind of broad brushstroke and you know, universally applicable as I can. Well, I think if anybody was reading your book and thinking, about at the same time about relearning a traditional skill it certainly offers some you know useful thought material to say what perhaps would interest me what could i do because this is a very serious question about about maintaining these skills and about being able to pass them on yeah there's the you know kind of cultural inheritance is, is how we've been able to accumulate and build up knowledge over time and it'd be everything from you know from a, a blacksmith or a carpenter teaching his trade, teaching his craft to, you know, either his own son or to an apprentice. And you get this kind of, you know, continual lineage, this this bucket chain of expertise being passed from one person to another. And what we're risking, what we're a threat of today is some of these traditional crafts, you know, kind of falling out completely, you know, like some kind of expertise falling extinct almost, because so few people have got interest nowadays of learning some of these traditional things and you know, traditional methods for making clothes, perhaps, that, that maybe they'll be forgotten altogether. And I think culturally this, this would be a travesty. I think it'd be great to try and keep these traditional methods alive in the same way it's great to try and keep languages alive, not just have them kind of fall out of uh, into disuse. Um, even if, the, if there isn't going to be some kind of apocalypse in the coming years, I think just for cultural reasons, it's great to try and keep all of these things alive. And what's been really nice to see over the last couple of years is this resurgence in kind of crafts and, and arts. And there's a lot of, you know, kind of hacker, hack spaces and, and communities growing up 
uh, where people are taking things that you can buy off the shelf and are learning how to use them themselves and modify them and manipulate them and, and use them in different ways and stop being just consumers, but now start turning back to being you know, kind of innovators all over again. I think these are really important movements to, to prevent us you know, just you know, becoming zombies for kind of what adverts are trying to get us to buy the whole time. Well, I will, we'll just give a shout out to a friend of mine who works in the UK with the Heritage Skills Initiative. So if any UK listeners are interested in some of these issues, you could perhaps look at their website. Lots of information about courses and practical things you can actually do. But I don't want to get apocalyptic on you again, but a particular area of concern for me is the realm of uh, computing and digital information, how much of our knowledge has never existed in printed form, but exists vir- virtually as ones and nots. Or there was even move over towards cloud storage now, so the data isn't even on individual machines. And uh, this crosses over into the world of the internet and the future of communications. If there was even a, a pandemic, again, a lot of the communications and things would run for a while. But if you don't have the people to maintain the systems, even if they're in good condition, then you're into you're into a whole new set of, of issues. Let's not say problems, but issues about how you're going to how you're going to retrieve this data if that can be done and how you're going to communicate with you know, what's left of the human race around the world. Mm, so the, the great irony is that the internet, although it was originally devised in the you know, kind of 60s and 70s by the US um, to serve as a, a distributed communication network that could survive uh, a nuclear attack and then the loss of some of the nodes, um, the, the internet would be one of the first things to disappear if there were to be an apocalypse, because, because the internet and the servers that run it and, and the World Wide Web that's stored on those servers is as reliant on a continual electricity supply as anything else that's, that's kind of high tech. So as soon as you have this you know, kind of apocalyptic scenario, this collapsed civilization, and people stop tending the power stations and the grid goes down, and you might get a couple of days worth of emergency uh, backup generators or even batteries in some of the servers, eventually they will fall fall, fall over as well. And the internet will disappear. And as you're saying, I mean, if, if the internet were to go, were to disappear, who on earth would know what server farm to go to, to physically travel to, to try to kind of um, boot back up again and save whatever critical data might have been stored on that? I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin trying to look up the physical location of some of this information. So there, there are some great projects um, around the world where people are aware of these problems and are trying to make genuine efforts and attempts to store critical information on a, you know, on a kind of reliable storage medium that isn't electronic and that they wouldn't disappear once the grid went down. Um, and the Long Now Foundation um, is, is one such organisation I've been working with um, that's trying to build up what they call the uh, the Manual for Civilization, so kind of a library of key texts that they are storing physical books of um, in, a, in, a, in a collection and a library. Um, to, to weather the, the kind of storm, as it were. Um, one of the things I talk about on the book's website, um, which, again, is, is the hyphen knowledge.org, um, are kind of gadgets that you can buy. And there's there's a great one uh, called a wiki reader, which is a, kind of a, a, a pocket gadget that you can download the text of Wikipedia on to keep in your pocket or, you know, put into your bug out bag. Uh, if, if civilization does collapse, you, you can keep hold of it. Um, and again, kind of slightly tongue in cheek, I say the one one bit of kit you want to be able to get uh, is a kind of ruggedized Kindle or other e-reader and a solar panel so you can keep it recharged even when the grid goes down and load onto it the book, load onto it the knowledge and a couple of other kind of handbooks and guides and manuals that I list on, on the book's website that you can all download. And many of these are available for free, by the way, and just keep that somewhere safe and uh, know where it is if you, if you need to be able to find it again and go to it in an emergency. Uh, well, you mentioned that organization a moment ago, uh, working with the books. I'm also reminded of the seed banks. Now, I knew about the, the one up near the Arctic, uh, but in your book, you mentioned one down is it in Sussex, but I had no idea that existed. Yeah, the Millennium Seed Bank is a, um, it, it kind of buds off of, of Kew Gardens. So it's a, a scientific research uh, institution, and they are trying to save not just the seeds from crop species, um, but also you know, kind of fruit trees and, and, and plants and, and wild species. And the idea here is, and, and this, uh, this resource and the um, Svalbard um, Global Seed Bank, which is up in, um, up in the high Arctic, the, these would serve as agricultural save files. If, if there were to be some kind of apocalypse, 
uh, particularly the Svalbard site, because it's you know embedded in the permafrost. And even if the power goes down, these seeds would remain cold and preserved for a long period of time. These would be the perfect place to go to to gather the seeds you need to start rebooting agriculture for yourself and then growing your own food. But it, I mean, but even before that, even without thinking of such kind of extreme and unlikely scenarios, just trying to preserve this natural genetic diversity and variability is incredibly important for ensuring that we can continue growing enough food for ourselves as the world changes around us. And, and climate change um, is a real thing. It's already happening. There's already been changes to kind of weather patterns and, and productivity of certain plants is going to start going down. And the way to combat this and ensure that agriculture remains successful is to make sure we've got kind of wild species we can go back to and start crossbreeding with to try to reintroduce, you know, kind of drought resistance or resistance to particular pests uh, to make sure we can, you know, as I say, keep agriculture going. And, and that's what the uh, Millennium Sea Bank and, and Kew Gardens are, are trying to achieve. Uh, towards the end of the book, you discuss the issue of uh, in a you know post-apocalyptic world, how we would decide, find out what time it was and where we were. And now that might be fine if you're in London, whatever, and you wake up um, after the apocalypse and you're still in London, you know your way around. But maybe the clock stopped working. Yeah, you can tell by the sun and everything roughly what's happening. But if you're going to start to reconstruct, then there would be you know, and again, after a passage of time, a year, two years, you start thinking about growing food, start thinking about the seasons. Suppose you, you know, we decided you and I, okay, let's get a boat and go to Norway and get those seeds. It's like, okay, uh, which way is Norway? Obviously, people have known for thousands of years, they've had different systems for telling the time and locating themselves and navigating around the globe. But some of that stuff might have to be relearned if some of our modern systems were temporarily or maybe permanently disabled. Yeah, so th this chapter um, was one of my favourites. I enjoyed this, uh, researching, writing this chapter more than more than many of the other ones, because it, it, it's a really nice little self-contained thought experiment in its own right. And let, let's imagine, um, and we can move away from the apocalypse but for this particular thought experiment, let's just imagine you've woken up from some kind of cryogenic pod, or you've woken up from a coma on, on a desert island somewhere. How do you work out where you are and what time it is? And these aren't kind of you know, frivolous kind of facetious questions, um, because being able to answer those two questions, being able to work out where in the world you are and what time of day it is, or more importantly, what day of the year it is, are absolutely crucial functions if you're going to start trying to rebuild, um, you know, a, a complex society and start recovering civilization. Because in terms of agriculture, you absolutely need to be able to start being able to predict um, when the rains might start coming or, or when w winter is going to draw in. So you know when you have to start trying to harvest your crops early before they start getting damaged or destroyed in the fields. And therefore, you need to kind of back up from that and know when is the best time of the year to, of, to plant your seeds and, and, and sow them. So the question of what day of the year it is, is basically a question of how you reconstruct the calendar, get yourself back in tune with the cycle of the seasons and make sure agriculture doesn't fail you simply so you don't starve to death. And the question of being able to work out where in the world you are, what your position on the globe is, is basically the, the fundamentals of navigation. And over the generations and over a long, longer term of, of recovering a civilization, you're going to need to start trading uh, with other people and, and swapping things and, and resources that can only be found in particular places in the world and trading them with each other. And that is often going to mean traveling across the sea, sailing across the oceans. And when you're out in the middle of an ocean where you have no landmarks or any other means of, of trying to triangulate your position and work out where you are, you're going to have to have uh, relearned the, the core skills of navigation. A lot of this is going to rely on, on the heavens and being able to, to look at the stars. So in that chapter, I kind of wrapped together those two ideas, which are quite deeply linked when you, when you kind of dig down into the very essence of it uh, and answer the question, where am I? And what time is it? In terms of navigation, at one point you offer the fascinating vision of uh, eventually the orbiting Earth satellites crashing down into the sea when mm. they eventually fail. And that was just sort of, I just imagine that was mesmerizing. I don't know why. I think it would, it would be such <laughs> a big statement about something that it would be just a big final kind of full stop, I think, for many things <laughs> if that happened. So certainly, so things in low Earth orbit would decay relatively quickly over kind of years and decades and something like the International Space Station 
would fall down surprisingly quickly uh, when it no longer boosts its orbit um, with astronauts on board and, and it being refueled. So the, the space station would fall down pretty quickly. But geostationary satellites, which do a lot of communications and, and things like that, um, they're basically immortal. They're in such a high orbit that they would stay there um, forever. And they, they would still be reflective and shiny with their solar panels or just the kind of metallic surfaces they're made out of. And I explain in the book um, how you can use that fact, how you can spot geostationary satellites. They do something very quirky in the night sky that I explain. And you can demonstrate that there's geostationary satellites up there in the night sky and use that to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there must have been some kind of um, technologically capable civilization before your own. So if we were to go, if civilization were to collapse, and even tens of thousands of years in the future, after all of our cities have disappeared, everything's covered in rainforest, and another uh, civilization rises up and takes a couple of centuries to kind of redevelop things like telescopes and photography and things, there's a very clever way that they can demonstrate that there was our civilization even long, long um, in the past. And again, I, I found that a, a kind of a mind blowing idea of, of how you can use that science to, to prove something for yourself. Oh, that's like in uh, Beneath the Planet of the Apes when they, they have that cult worshipping the nuclear bombs because it was evidence of the greatness of mankind. <laughs> Although the kind of monument of the uh, Statue of Liberty kind of emerging out of the beach, yeah. the state, these geostationary orbits would be much, much uh, longer lived monuments to, you know, to human capability and human prowess, um, once, even after we've, our species might have long since fallen extinct. In closing, Lewis, I just want to say a word about culture. Obviously, we talked about various scenarios, global disasters and how it could affect our short term and long term prospects for survival. But in many ways, this culture is what makes us human and different scenarios could play out that could affect how our culture survives. You know, you know art, music, sculpture, all the rest of it. And a lot of it, if we had a, a technological future that was very unlike the one we have now, we could lose a lot of that. When I mean, you think of the Roman Empire, for example, and how much Roman music survives, um, I think it's like one bar. Wouldn't it be a shame if one bar of 20th century music <laughs> survived and it was a da 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 da, da you know? Or, or something by Britney Spears. There was a particular earworm of Britney but, Spears that managed to survive. Exactly. No, but it would be a case of, you know, could, would it then go back to oral tradition, sheet music? We'd have a lot of written books depending on the scenario. But for me, that's a real key to, because once you get past your hierarchy of needs and your basic survival, then it's culture. That's what we. That's what we do. Really, we create things. No, I think I think you're absolutely right on this, Greg. Um, and the knowledge is is a popular science book, so it focuses on just the science and technology you would need to rebuild a civilization. But of course, the kind of the, the cultural side and the artistic expression of, of humanity is just as important. And I enjoy going to a concert or an art museum uh, just as much as the next person. But what I argue about in the book is that the reason I think it's more important to try to preserve these condensed kernels, the essence of the most crucial science and technology, is that civilization could be held back, you know, 500 years if you don't have, if you don't give some of the secret of successful agriculture or the kind of basic chemistry they might need or the kind of scientific method to start trying to rediscover things for yourself. So I think the science technology it's going to be practically very important for covering civilization, but but the kind of art and music less so. And I think it's also very fair to say that if, if a post-apocalyptic civilization were to, you know, kind of rise from the ashes and start rebuilding, it would start making its own music and its own artistic impression and write its own stories and novels. And they wouldn't necessarily want to kind of inherit our culture, our, our music and art. And um, perhaps for anything other than, you know, kind of historical interest and in the same way that tourists might go around, you know, particular Roman sites and kind of look at the architecture and the mosaics and things. But you would never use that that design to decorate your kitchen or, or, or your bedroom wall with. You'd use something that has resonance and kind of significance to you in, in your age that, that we have today. Um, so I, I leave out kind of music and arts and things like that from the knowledge and I try and justify it as best I can. And I think that there's good, good, good reasons behind that. But but I certainly wouldn't want to live in a future where there is no art and no music whatsoever. Lewis, today we've been talking about your book, The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World from Scratch. 
that's available everywhere. But uh, perhaps you'd like to tell people about uh, your websites. I know there's one dedicated to the book and anything else you'd like to share. Yeah, so I mean, as I said, the, the book is out there and you can uh, get in hardback at the moment or audio book. But what I've always wanted um, from when I first sat down with this project is for the book to just be the starting point of, of this project. Um, and I'm very keen to involve everyone else and then hear what are your ideas and what would you try to preserve if all else was lost? What do you think is the most crucial knowledge and expertise and skills? So alongside the, the published book, there's a website which you can go to and it can explore all of the material that didn't make it into the book. And there's a load of how to uh, articles, a load of videos that we filmed um, to link into the book. Uh, and the website is the hyphen knowledge org the dash knowledge.org and in particular on that website there's a tab called discuss which you can click on to and start putting down your own ideas and joining the conversation with everyone else that's on the website uh, discussing how they would start rebuilding civilization after the apocalypse and, and say what they think would be the most important things to try and preserve um, and i've been very much enjoying reading through all of those discussions and chats and kind of contributing to them as well well lewis thank you so much for joining us today on legalizefreedom.com Thanks ever so much, Craig. This you know. The years travel fast. And time after time I done the tell. But this ain't one body's tell. It's the tell of us all. And you gotta listen it and remember. Cause what you hear's today, you gotta tell the newborn tomorrow. I's looking behind us now. Into history back. I sees those of us that got the luck and started the hall for home. And I remembers how it led us here and how we was heartful because we seen what there once was. One look and we knew we'd got it straight. Those what had gone before had the knowing and the doing of things beyond our reckoning, even beyond our dreaming. Time counts and keeps counting. And we knows now, finding the trick of what's been and lost ain't no easy ride. But that's our track. We gotta travel it, and there ain't nobody knows where it's gonna lead. Still and all, every night we does the tell, so that we remember who we was and where we came from. But most of all, we remembers the man who finded us, him that came the salvage, and we lights the city. Not just for him, but for all of them that are still out there. Cause we knows there'll come a night. When they seize the distant light, and I'll be coming home, and I'll be coming home.